Welcome to Unity Now, the podcast where we discuss unity in the face of division. Inspired by the Unity 2020 plan, we strive to unite Americans by highlighting the middle ground between the two dominant parties and promoting the individual over groups. Each episode, we will bring you exciting, well-informed guests and host nuanced conversations about politically charged subjects. Our goal is to bring an end to the ideological war threatening the collective well-being of this great country. Howdy, howdy. Welcome back to Unity Now podcast. I'm host Gabe Garber, and today we are breaking from our regularly scheduled content to bring you something a little different. I'm joined by a couple teammates that you'll be familiar with if you've been following along thus far. Joined by Todd Neeson out in California. Hey, Todd, our sound guy. Howdy, howdy. And our captain, Kimberly from Virginia. How's it going? Great. Good to see you guys. Yeah, likewise. So, yeah, we have been internally talking about maybe incorporating some book club kind of aspects into into the podcast and finally decided to take the plunge and we had been talking about we knew pretty much from the start that this was one of the books that was motivating the idea to begin with so we will be have have will be discussing Jonathan Heights the righteous mind so it's been around a while he's a familiar name for most of the IDW crowd, as well as just, you know, he's an academic at, at NYU, and yeah, he's plenty of books. Coddling of the American Mind is more recent, uh, but this one definitely is foundational for him, for his career, dealing with kind of psychology and how it plays in to our, yeah, team identities, and and especially right now with, with political div- divides as as strong as they are. Um, and being that we started with the unity movement, trying to kind of bridge that gap and bring everyone together, this book we felt captured kind of the heart of, of the movement. And so we wanted to take the chance to sit down and just hash it out a bit. So hopefully you guys read the book. Oh, well, I listened to it. I listened to it. In fact, I re-listened to the last two chapters uh, on my drive today. So I'm ready. I'm, I'm well-versed. Perfect. Oh, good. Perfect. Cool. Um, well, I guess, yeah, just to kind of maybe get initial reactions, I figured I would just ask, you know, what were some takeaways or maybe expectations going into the book? Actually, we'll start there. Like, if, was there anything going into it that you were kind of tuned to tap into or, or perceive as you read it that you were looking for, maybe? I'll go first. I um, I just actually finished uh, an earlier book of his, uh, the, Hi- the Happiness Hypothesis, which is a great read, by the way. Um, so I was kind of familiar with him and uh, like the way he thinks. And I think, you know, going into it, it was... Um, I was very eager to, to try to dissect why we choose teams and, um, and how we got into this mess that we're in. <laughs> and just kind of jumping ahead, one of the, my thoughts was, you know, uh, does anybody have the, uh, the date? When was this written? Does it say? Um, I think 2013, but let me double 2013. check. Because it's funny, because like at the end, he's he's kind of summarizing and and saying that, um, you know, and and Americans are becoming more and more divided, and it's getting to like the breaking point. And I'm like, yeah, hold on another seven years. <laughs> you you don't know anything about dividedness until you know 2020 comes along, you know. So he saw it coming, and it was very prescient. Yeah. yeah. For me, I had high hopes that he would have some good tools, solid tools, research tools that would help me understand how we got divided and how we may get back together. Because on the podcast, we're all about highlighting the middle ground. And so I was like, 
okay, well, this is a good, a good foundation. If he could give more hope to people like us, then I'm all about reading this book. Yeah. And on the flip side of that, even just, yeah, thinking about the timeline of it and how, how prescient it really was, uh, it, it's almost kind of, it's, it's invaluable knowing that, you know, four years later after the book's published, we've got, you know, 2016 election is really kind of where things, you know, at least externally started to just get a bit crazier and crazier and start to kind of map on to maybe a lot of what he was seeing. He deals in psychology. So it's, it's a lot of internal stuff that he was noticing that finally found a way to break free into the real world by 2016 and throughout the, the Trump years. So yeah, hopefully there, you know, hopefully there's, there's plenty there to, to pull from. And I think both of you are right. And in, in visiting the book now, um, after our attempt at, at the unity movement and just in our kind of aftermath, trying to figure out what we do moving forward, how, how can we, how can we maybe incorporate some of these lessons um, or just frameworks and models of like how, how to view situations that we encounter in our life in a way that helps explain them a bit better. Yeah, I yeah. think, I think one of the, I mean, if I had to kind of summarize it and, and, and kind of uh, come up with a reason why people should read it is he's, it's incredibly even handed. I mean, he's not saying, you know, all liberals are good and all uh, conservatives are bad or vice versa. It's, he talks about, you know, the yin yang symbol and that we need both sides. And, um, you know, something that Brett said on a podcast, a couple, uh, Brett uh, Weinstein said a couple couple maybe a month ago was you know if you encounter someone that says that um that you know the world would just be better if we just got rid of all the republicans or the world would just be better if we got rid of all the liberals then they clearly don't know what they're talking about you know and and there's no good place to start from there so you know one of my one of the things that kept on coming into my hind in, into my head when i was reading it was if we could just make this like required reading like part of like a civic civics class in high school or something mm -hmm. where it's just it, it, people can absorb this you know before they get so polarized or at least they see what's gonna cause them to become polarized i think that could go a long way into um healing this country you know because everything that i read was it just landed it made so much sense and uh and it, it just for me it kind of gave me a, a little bit even more of a sense of relief it's like you know i don't have to hate my neighbor i don't have to hate you know the liberals that are pushing for this crazy stuff and i don't have to hate um uh, you know a, a, a whole group of people because they they have a different um, outlook on life and, and they are predisposed to look at life a certain way. So in a lot of ways, it was very freeing. It's just like, oh, great. You know, I, I just wish that they read it as well. And so that they could, we could all be on the same page, you know? Yeah. yeah. I think my biggest takeaway from this whole book was the morals, the authority, care, fairness, loyalty, and purity or sanctity. And people just weigh those differently. And he argues it's a little bit genetic, which I found interesting. He also argues that it's, you know, nurture and nature as well. And you're, you're going to be predisposed, predisp he argues, to be liberal or conservative depending on uh, uh, lots of different things. And once I read through that and then tested myself, which you can do at your, your uh, morals.org, I think it is, your morals.org, then you can see where you land, kind of like the political compass that we did last year, right? 
And it's really hard to argue with just however you assess. I was shocked at how I ex- assessed. And I then I had to have this dialogue, like, am I really way authority this high? And what does that say about me? And it was very interesting. Very, very interesting. And so if I'm having those questions about my own self, then who am I to judge someone else that thinks fairness and care are more important? I just found that very interesting. It gives that space to be curious, right? Definitely. Instead of reactive and angry. Yeah. I think almost there's, there's something about going through that process as well. That is like, it's just, you know, it's kind of plotting. There's a lot of, you know, it's, the exercise itself fleshes out and showcases how complicated and complex we are. So it's, it's almost by virtue of having to go through every single thing and think about it. it, You, there's some awareness or acknowledgement that like, Oh, I, I'm, I'm a weird combination of a lot of things that, that come together in ways that it's oftentimes very easy to just identify as one thing or put a label on it and simplify it down to that. And you kind of are forced to reckon with the complexity by doing these exercises. I think that's one of the big things. It's, it's not necessarily the easier path to take, but it is one that leads to better self awareness, self understanding. And yeah, Again, drawing this connection, it makes sense coming from him studying psychology. This is kind of individual work. But by doing that, we all stand a chance of better understanding ourselves. And yeah, I mean, I can't imagine a worse world where that's filled with people who have a better understanding of themselves. So it seems like (laughs) the only positive takeaway by doing that, those exercises. You know, I thought was interesting was that, um, you know, he talks about, you know, you're born, you know, with your genes with a predisposed, to be predisposed um, to be, you know, liberal or conservative. Um, It's not written in stone, but it's, it's there. And, uh, you know, your experiences after that can either uh, uh, reinforce or, or go, go in the other direction. And for me, the interesting thing that I thought about was, you know, I realize now that I'm, I'm, you know, more conservative than liberal, but, you know, growing up, you know, I was a musician, I liked art, um, I went to music school, and so I was surrounded, I mean, it's probably like, like 90, 95% liberals around me, and so I became one of them, you know, and it wasn't until... And, and yeah, it's, it's, it's almost embarrassing. I mean, I would like, you know, wear those like really obnoxious pins that said something like, you know, save a, a gay, you know, save a gay whale or shut the fuck up. Um, <laughs> you know, stuff that was just like, oh, yeah, you know, those stupid conservatives and blah, blah, blah. And it wasn't until like, you know, I left that and started doing a lot more reading and a lot more thinking. And it was like, well, wait, that doesn't really resonate with me. <laughs> So, um, so it's interesting how, how your experiences can kind of, sh- kind of reinforce or go against what you really are. Yeah. Well, I think that the most tempting thing of it, and it goes right into the title itself, the, the righteous mind is that you can, you could know all of these things, but we're still incentivized internally to, to kind of, I mean, it feels good to take that position and to know you're on the right side. And, and that justifies just about any behavior pattern and, and judgment that you might inflict on someone. So it's, you know, it's, it's not difficult to fall into that, especially when you're surrounded by that context that is reinforcing it all especially if you're genetically predisposed, all of that, all of those things factor in. But again, like just really hammering home the psychology point. And it's really interesting because I know Brett also recently talked about, or has been kind of on this kick of talking about the collective autoimmune response of like our own ability to, 
uh, yeah, protect ourselves against things like being proactive against that. And I think I think this fits into here of of just recognizing that if there's some internal deficiencies that I have going on, it will likely have implications in my external world of how I view the world and how I approach it. And if if I feel maybe I'm deficient in something, I might try to overprotect in the external sense. And especially if I feel like, well, I'm on the right side. So it justifies whatever I do to do that. It's it's a dangerous game, especially with how how easy and how 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 wired we seem to be to to fall into that and to need to categorize in order to protect ourselves to some extent. And it's comforting. You know, it's very comforting to be around people that believe the way you believe, you know, be part of that team. Yeah. Well, Jonathan had the red pill moment that a lot of us talk about in unity. And he came back from um, India, I believe, and saw conservatives differently than before when he had it a worldview, he changed, uh, he had a shift and he said he went from having a partisan mindset, which he defined as reject it and then ask rhetorical questions later and participating in partisan anger and then moving into a more um, civilized, civil political conversation where centered more in curiosity and maybe deeper understanding. So and a I willingness. It was, yeah. Mm-hmm. A willingness to actually, right. you know, come to the table. <laughs> yeah. So this all kind of goes with some things I've been doing in, ta- in tandem, basically with this reading of this book is I've been sitting in on a few of these braver angel um, depolarization sessions some are between the red and blue teams and some are just with one team and there was one depolarizing within that this is really i feel like it's very much based on um jonathan Hyde's work so i I feel like all of this kind of came together for me and now when i hear someone say something that normally I would have disagreed with, I'll go, well, that's interesting. I wonder what their experience is that led them to believe that. I'm not nearly as um, reactive, which is great because the less reactive we are, the better, I think. Yeah. Yeah. You know, one of the points that he makes is that he makes the, he uses the, um, the analogy of the, you know, the elephant and the rider Mm. and the elephant being your intuitions and the rider just being the guy that's, trying trying to uh, steer the elephant and that and and he uses those those two um, items on purpose I mean the elephant's huge and the rider's relatively small and you know I think the point he's making well the point that he does make and this might be interested for the for our listeners is that the the elephant is like intuition so mm-hmm. it's like your knee-jerk reaction it's maybe the way you're wired or the people that you hang out with. And so you have this reaction to something. And then after that, then your brain starts working out rationalizations to why that, why that works for, for you, you know, why it makes sense. And uh, so we're not nearly as logical as we like to think we are. You know, we, we go with the intuition first and then we come up with the reasons afterwards to the way we feel. And that's why you can't, just throw facts at people to try to change their mind. You know, you need yeah. to uh, figure out what their intuitions are and go that route first. And, you yeah. know, one of the points that he makes is, is, you know, find some common ground with this person first, you know, find something that you, that your elephants can agree on, that your elephants <laughs> are, are in tandem, you know? And so when your elephant is like starting to veer off this way, I mean, if you're friends with the other elephant, maybe, you know, you can kind of go this way a little bit with them. And it's much easier to like uh, uh, get them to see your your viewpoint if you've already established um, that your elephants are friends. Yeah. Yeah. It's so much less volatility. And again, yeah, you just, it's 
building the relationship uh, essentially ahead of time or on the front end before really kind of, you know, diving Diving in deep to, to some charged, yeah, charged territory. Yeah. Can I interrupt? I, when he talks about that, the common ground and finding where they're coming from and listening and I still feel like it's a series of conversations that needs to happen because it takes a long time, I feel like, to become conscious of your intuitions, of your motivators, of your personality style. And even when you're conscious of it, it's difficult. So I feel like this is not a one-time or two-time kind of thing. And you might not even feel like you have made any progress because the first time you listen to someone might just be a one way they're just talking to you just getting it out and you might never do more than shake your head and look at them and so what he's asking of the reader is quite a lot (laughs) i think Mm. yeah at one level it does help if you can at least accept that that's how it is and and knowing that you start if you start doing the work for yourself you will realize how how much that entails and i think if you can extend that out and to honor that you have no idea where in this path uh the other person that you're you're interacting with is coming from like they might be way more developed than you are in which case it might be you know, you might be justified in holding them a bit more accountable, but ultimately you don't know where someone else is on that, on that journey of, of trying to become, trying to understand the intuitions or at least connect with their own intuitions. And so even, even if I'm very early on, knowing that it's such a long journey can help, I think, make that connection and offer grace to the other person it it makes that a little bit more easy to access for me knowing that man this is hard work it must be hard work for them too i don't know where exactly they are in their progress but wherever they are like i i should extend them some some amount of grace and again that's within my control but it's often hard to get to that point and i think what you were saying kimberly like it does kind of shine a light on that and i think yeah, just to reiterate, like, if you know how hard it is because you've started the process, then it, it becomes much easier to accept that other people may or may not be as far along as you are. You know, it's funny that that reminds me, Gabe, of, of another thought I had. You know, he talks about, you know, the such uh, innate um, uh, uh, desire for us to all become parts of a tribe, parts mm-hmm. of a club and pick a side. And the thought that I had was, you know, over the last year, you know, and my experience with Unity 2020 and with meeting all you guys and all that is now you're my tribe. This, you know, this uh, heterodoxy, um, uh, you know, intellectual dark web people, um, all this, you know, psychological reading and all that, that's my tribe now. And so I don't know if, it, if this resonates with anybody else, but now I'm looking at not only the Democratic Party, but also the Republican Party as the other. You know, it's, it's like now I'm with the cool kids and I don't, and now I, I have like almost equal disdain for anybody that's, that's like hyper-partisan on either side. You know, even though I came from the Republican Party, it's like now I'm hearing stuff that they're saying or, or, you know, people that are, you know, uh, you know, spewing lots of stuff uh, from from the party. I'm like, I have equal um, my my trigger, my 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 knee jerk reaction is to have equal uh, uh, dismissal for them as well as the far left. Mm -hmm. So I, I wonder if if you guys have any of that experience as well. Well, I don't bathe in partisan anger waters anymore. I will say that. (laughs) Well, at least you bathe. (laughs) 
I mean, seriously, I feel like I was trying to get information and the price that I was paying to get that was too high. It was making me unpleasant. And I'll tell you who's a great mirror are your children. Mm. And they commented more than once last year that I was less happy. That's not probably what they said, but they said, if I watched the news in the evening, which was a habit of ours, Mm -hmm. which we have since then changed. And I actually haven't watched the evening news in 2021, except for 15 minutes. And then I said, Oh, that's right. I'm not doing this for this reason. (laughs) (laughs) So I have to really work to get my news now. So that's my experience, Todd. And, I don't know if we're the cool kids, but I'll tell you when um, I had a Unity 2020 guy come and visit me in person uh, last week. It was one of the best evenings because we had this common com- common vocabulary, base of knowledge, um, goals, and we were really curious, like where this would take us next. And, and we were also very serious about continuing to do this really hard work. So it's kind of nice. Yeah. Nice. Awesome. Yeah. There is something kind of nerdy though, Todd. What was that? A little nerdy. We're the the uncool kids. (laughs) Sorry, Gabe. Yeah. (laughs) We're the uncool kids. Yeah. If anything, it's, it is interesting because I I mean, so much of that, highlights how much it's not even necessarily that that bridge can't be gapped with people but there's just kind of a building sense that like when you go into something that it is very likely could be charged and could be like navigating that little rough patch in between where, you know, something has to be exchanged, words have to be exchanged, ideas have to be exchanged and accepted so that you can both understand that you can let your guard down and like just really bring all of yourself to whatever that conversation, debate, you know, workshop, whatever it is, brainstorming thing. Like if we can't let the filters down, then we're we're really limiting ourselves in terms of what what we might be able to achieve through accessing the networks that we have. Otherwise, if we just kind of settle for the the diluted watered down thing, us, you know, coming together or, you know, Craig making his way over there could have just been regurgitating more of the same thing over and over. And it could have just been, you know, fine. But again, we're, we're striving to work beyond something and coming to, yeah, again, bringing, coming to the table with fully good intentions, you know, they're, they're operating, um, in good faith and that, that comfort and understanding of mutual kind of support, uh, regardless of what, what the ideas come out that, that are brought by the other person that, you know, we're here to do this. So it doesn't have to be perfect, but you're here, I'm here. I support you and what you're doing and what we're trying to accomplish. You know, Jonathan um, Haidt gives a warning that if you are having a conversation with someone that's hung up on one of the morals, so those are authority, care, fairness, loyalty, and sanctity. If you listen as the active listener, you hear a lot of one of those, then you're dealing with a fundamentalist. And he's like, your time is best spent with someone different. That person's not ready. So I thought that was a good um, piece of information. <laughs> and that's funny yeah. too, because save them all. The the inverse side of that, the the contour of that is that again, it's very tempting. And I know plenty of friends, mm-hmm. especially from my experience with even just like uh, becoming an atheist. Like there was a phase where it was just you know it's so tempting to just dig in and be like, here's where you're wrong. Here's you know it. <laughs> It doesn't matter. It's just as tempting on either side. 
And in this case, it's just, it's better not to engage. It's you're wasting your own time by engaging with someone who's that, that firm in their stances. Mm -hmm. And you just stand to, you know, wear yourself out. I did have a question for, for Kimberly, you know, they, uh, you know, when uh, Jonathan was talking about, um, you know, you're born with certain traits and you're born with certain um, uh, innate abilities or ways of leaning. And I think he said, you know, there's some people that, you know, are born leaders, you know, and uh, there are other ones that are, you know, more uh, the bees in the hive. You know, and someone usually steps up to become the leader. And like in your experience, Kimberly, in in the military, do you think that, you know, that people that don't have leadership skills can actually learn to be a good leader? Or is it such an uphill battle that putting someone in a leadership position that's not really suited for that is almost worse than not promoting them at all? Mm. It's a great question. So my experience is that you, we all had an opportunity to learn leadership. It's also my experience that I didn't see everybody take to it like a duck in water. Mm. Mm-hmm. I would include myself in that because, um, believe it or not, I was, voted most friendly two times in my childhood. And I believe it. Not surprising at all. Yeah. Well, that's kind. I mean, I feel like I have a, a definitely a sharp edge to me. Um, but back then I was just as friendly as I guess the friendliest person. And so that got in my way of asking people to do something hard in the military, a lot of times you're given a task that you cannot possibly accomplish yourself. So you're forced to ask your team to do it and to continue to do it and to stay engaged and stay in the mission. And sometimes you don't even know what the mission is and you just have to toe the line and say, well, let's just be patient, which is not a popular thing to say when you're standing in the hundred degree sun and you're full uniform. So I had to learn to just toughen up, thicken up and ask people to do things that I wouldn't necessarily be able to do. And that was hard for me. I think so. Um, but I, if you dig a little deeper to the principles of armed forces leadership, which maybe this is embarrassing, but I have this on my wall upstairs in my office (laughs) (laughs) and you brought it down. (laughs) I did. Because the first thing you're supposed to do in, with the principles is to know yourself and seek self-improvement. So that's kind of what Jonathan's saying to us. Like, you know, what are you? You know, what are your intuitions and are you aware of them? And then, you know, be responsible for your subordinates, right? Set the example. And that's all that groupishness that he talks about. You know, he Mm -hmm. talks about how we're 90% chimp and 10% bee, you know, Mm -hmm. that, Mm -hmm. is that what he says we are? Yeah, 90 to 10. And so, um, keep people informed, seek responsibility and take responsibility for your actions, train your people as a team. Um, so it's all about the unit, the team in the military. So if you're not going to become a leader after 20 years, you probably weren't meant to be, but that's okay because, you know, for every 10 soldiers, there needs to be nine followers that are really, and that's very important to have nine followers, actually. I mean, I think that's just as important and not blind followers, but a follower that will look out for the group too and be uh, maybe as a devil's advocate to the leader. Yeah, but well, one of the things there is that those individuals will be able to perform best on the team by understanding what specific constellation of skills and and, and tendencies that they possess, understanding themselves individually, so that so that they can offer 
what they're best suited for and and know where they're flexible and can flex in because again it is all in service of the team or the you know the troop and yeah again just going back to the understanding yourself if you understand that if you're if you're attached to an idea that you need to strive to be a leader but you're not necessarily like those skills don't come naturally and it's hard work for you to do it but you're still just fighting it you stand to kind of you you might you will likely project out over security uh you know there's different ways that that'll come through but you stand to serve the team best by understanding yourself better than anyone else and offering what you have as opposed to you know stepping up with maybe a, a false a, a a lower resolution understanding of yourself and and trying to you know fit a square peg into a round hole right and and todd he talked a lot about selfishness remember about you know there's the selfish people make civilization you know go forward or not mm-hmm. or the cooperative people um i think he used a different word from cooperative um group Groupish. intentional is mm-hmm. that right yeah. And and so he made he had a couple paragraphs on the military about the selfish leaders or selfish troops will find themselves pretty severely dealt with in the military. You'll either mm. be drummed out or, you know, in worst case scenario, shot in the back. Um, right. so they don't come back from war and have more children. So that gene is not, um, doesn't go forward to the next generation. I thought that was very interesting because there's nothing worse than a, we have a word for it. It's Bravo Fox truck. A blue Falcon is the nice way to say it, but (laughs) we're not saying on this podcast, Todd. (laughs) Well, now I'm curious. Use your imagination at home, run wild. (laughs) And that's like the worst thing you can be, I think, out of everything in the military is somebody that cannot be trusted to do what they're supposed to be done. Because Mm. if you think about it, the whole purpose of the military is to move as a unit together. And the cohesion is what makes a military strong and successful. So. Yeah. Yeah. So wild again, just playing with those spectrums. It's you know, the the self understanding does nothing for you if it's not understood that you're doing that to to contribute to the whole. Mm. It's it's about finding some balance, and he even talks about that. It's like this happens in between, like this. You know, it's not at the individual level or at the hive level, but the true kind of transcendence happens somewhere in between. And Mm -hmm. it's, again, like understanding that you're all you have, but that is also a piece of everything. And so, again, like the best that you can be is understanding where you fit in the best or, yeah, doing your best to understand what what your what your part in all of this is. Did that answer your question, Todd? Yes. Yes. I mean, if there's, if you want to go on more about the military, it serves as like a a nice kind of a nice, a nice model to base it off of just in terms of the the group dynamics and the individuals within that. I thought, yeah, I mean, even getting back to, or or that makes me think of, um, uh, he cites a study. um, I'm trying to think who it is here. Uh, uh, Putnam. He wrote an article called uh, E Pluribus Unum, and uh, they did a bunch of um, tests and studies, and they found that, um, like, the places that have the most diversity, um, you would think that that would have the most um, uh, understanding and cooperation amongst the groups. But in general, like the cities that have the most diversity, um, the places that have the most diversity, those groups tend to hunker down 
he uses that term, hunker down or to turtle mm -hmm. up. And they just kind of become part of their own group. And they find that they found that not only is there less trust between the groups, but there's also less trust within the group that you're in. Um, I didn't quite understand how that came about, but that's what the uh, that's what the study showed. And the only thing that really worked as an antidote to that was joining groups where everyone's together, where it's where it's it's combined together, um, such as church groups, um, you know, maybe clubs, and uh, military or police. It's like that. The only mm -hmm. and time they said, you know, and over time they'll start to to meld together. But you know, the places that have the most immigration tend to have the most um, uh, seclusion, and the only way to to get them to unseclude is to have them, you know, join groups, and military is one of them. And I thought that was interesting. It reminds me of when I was a retailer. I know this is strange connection, but when I was a retailer, we would do samples and you never want to do more than a few samples because if you do more then people can't make a decision at all. So it's, it's, if you're in a very diverse environment, maybe it's, there's too many samples. And so you just say, forget it. I can't do any of these because I'm overwhelmed. I don't know. That might be, why he had those conclusions, Todd, because there wasn't just A, B, and C, there was A, B, C, D, E, F, and then it was just too much. Mm. It was too much work for an individual to figure out where they were felt safe. Yeah. Could yeah. be. Yeah, we have that's all very interesting. Get overwhelmed easily. <laughs> yeah. Well, and again, it just kind of speaks to like our sort of our, our compulsion, our natural kind of proclivity towards, you know, we categorize that's something basic that our, our brain does. And we tend to, we tend to feel more comfortable around similar, similarly categorized people or beings or whatever, things that we understand kind of don't rock the boat really. It's, it, it, I mean, it's comfort in a lot of ways and, and it is harder to immerse yourself or at least just introduce some of these other elements and you have to do it. Yeah. You have to intentionally make a deliberate choice to do it oftentimes. Um, and so it, you're, you're just kind of swimming upstream a lot of ways. Everybody kind of seems to have to go upstream in order to, to meet there because there's so much other that's just like working. That's just, yeah, that's, that's part of their, the current they're in. Well, remember how we were all brought into unity 2020 at the articles of unity.org website and it had the hidden drop tribes report right there. Right. So like that was a visual representation right from the get go for mo many of us, if not most, I mean, most of us, if not meant all of us, that we were not insane. There were nuances to being a Democrat or a Republican. And most Americans fall in the middle, not extreme right, not extreme left. And that was very comforting, but not everybody's seen that report and, and can look at where they lie on, you know, moderate conservatives or, or uh, moderate liberals or whatever they happen to be, whatever tribe they happen to be in. And this goes into how the loudest pieces, the extreme conservative and the extreme liberal are aggressive. And I was recently listening to Jordan Peterson and he was talking about how aggression manifests in males, another famous psychologist like Jonathan Haidt. Mm -hmm. um, it's a physical aggression in males and in females, it's a reputational aggression. So if you're an extremist and you're feeling aggressive because you're swept up in partisan anger, you're going to reach for what's natural. And I find that fascinating. 
Hmm. Yeah. Well, especially too now with so much um, of the emphasis on trying to signal to those crowds your your what which team you identify with and having to almost compete to show your more like show your credentials like really you know wear the the color on your sleeve there there is that sense of competition and and you're always going to aim beyond what you're normally comfortable with in order to signal that you belong to one side or the other you may you might communicate something that is beyond what you know what you yourself might even believe in or yeah i don't know so it, 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 even it's just tying that all back in again with understanding yourself because if you if there's weaknesses in what you know about yourself then that's where you're going to get captured and understand like oh this is this is kind of my outer bound uh and in terms of where all my values are i understand that to be true so i'm not I'm not insecure about my place and where I am. I, you hear Brett and Heather say, it's like, we are liberal. Like we have been liberals our entire life. We've been on the left our entire life. We're not, we're not abandoning because the, the field has shifted underneath us. Like I know where I am. So they're much less likely Mm -hmm. because they know they understand themselves. And if we understand ourselves, we're much less likely to, to over project out to the extremes to, yeah, to again, signal that, no, we're, we're really on your side. Yeah, to be part of the crowd. Yeah. Yeah, and the Hidden Tribes people have come up with a new test called the Perception Gap, which is exciting to take, it doesn't take long. And then you can see um, if you're uh, a, on the red team, what's your perception of the blue team and how accurate is that? And then if you're on the blue team, what oh, nice. your perception of the red team is. And um, I was at 15%, which I thought was terrible, but I have been told <laughs> that that's actually a pretty good score. <laughs> how, yeah. What's the, you, you know more about all of these. You were just saying how you were surprised that you turned out to be so like authoritative, but maybe like you're pushing all these questionnaires and surveys <laughs> to get to know ourselves. So it's, it's maybe not authoritarian, but you're trying to trying to categorize us or get us to categorize ourselves. Take these yeah, you know more about this. Go like, <laughs> tell us more about the perception. Yeah, gap. that's what I'm doing. That's probably why I ranked high authority. In fact, I was higher than most conservatives, which cracked me up. <laughs> I was like, oh no, but I have one good report. I was lower than the red team or the blue team, and disgust. And disgust wow. is that that big motivator to reject stuff charges so that much Jonathan yeah. Haidt talks mm-hmm. about and my disgust it's so deep was limited to contaminants and I think it's because I was raised by a microbiologist and she told me <laughs> in detail how many diseases every fly carried and you know <laughs> how bad food you know you don't keep it more than three days like she would tell me all the gross details of what would happen to your contaminated food? So, so I did have a redeeming feature, but then I'm like, but I'm the first one to question authority. So I really have to think about this for a while. In Jonathan's book, uh, he talked about a similar um, study where they had uh, liberals and conservatives and they had to um, uh, pretend they were the other and had a bunch of questions to answer. And because conservatives function on all six um, levels of, of um, morals, um, they're, they're better equipped to empathize with the feelings from the left or from, from, from liberals. But because liberals, for the most part, um, only function on the fairness uh, module, um, they can't put themselves in the, the conservative shoes as easily. So I, it's kind of like along the lines of what you were just saying, Kimberly. Yeah. And it's not, yeah, so, not to say that conservatives are better than liberals. It's just no. that. Sounds like that's what you're saying, Todd. I got to uh, step <laughs> in here. 
<laughs> no, I think As it's this, interesting. This, because there's this always is why a pro I can and never, con to everything. This is why so, I can never like explain stuff that I've read because I never get it right. Oh, no, no, no. I mean, I, I feel like that makes sense. It's maybe just like a balanced perspective as opposed to where you're saying a lot of these, the modules, the preference for certain things is going to lead lead perception to be different among groups. And if, if one group tends to view things through a certain lens, and I mean, if anything, I would say to what you were saying, you, the way you said it was like they only use the fair, view things through the fair, fairness lens. It's more of that it's not that they only do that, but that's overwhelmingly what they tend to value the most. And so it makes sense that that's the first, one of the first uh, tools that the, the lenses that they view things through. Whereas maybe across that sampling of, of conservatives, it's a much wider range. There's no one module that is represented more often. It's, yeah. Right. Yeah, it's, it's, it's usually a little bit more... Um evenly spread out yeah so. yeah i was thinking about this authority fairness thing because it came up in my life and like i try to structure it because of my authority i think <laughs> <laughs> but i was trying to frame it in my head so let's just say i disagree with someone on i don't know let's take a health care or something and they're like yeah but it's not fair so i hear they're saying it's not fair so i'm i understanding what they're valuing in that conversation. I guess my counter argument, if I ever got to that place, which who knows, would be, but there has to be some rules in place to make sure it's fair. I think that's, I think that's where the rub is between conservatives and liberals. I really do. And I really want to think about that more because it's like the chicken, the egg thing, like, the liberals want the chicken and the conservatives want the egg or whatever. And it, it, it's not, and they're both talking about the chickens, <laughs> but you know, mm -hmm. we're, we're acting like the other one's so wrong that you're stupid, which is ridiculousness. Yeah. And I think that's our, I'm trying that's to... where unity comes in. We're like, both of you guys are right. Yeah. 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 I think that's a huge part of it is that, you know, there is that gap where a lot of times, you know, and, and we're also living in a time where there has just been obstruction all over the place in our government. So it's not like uh, Democrats don't have ample, uh, ample examples to look at towards to say, well, they, they, they're not willing to work together. They're just obstructing what we can do. So it's like, wanting to put rules that are fair is also an easy way to just kind of kick the can down the road and you can flip it. And the Republicans have the same to say like, well, if so-and-so is in charge, whatever, they're just getting in the way of getting it done. And what we're losing by over identifying with one team mentality over the other. And this is what unity was pointing at is that they're both doing the same thing that isn't serving us and actually is obstructing the whole process. Yeah. Whereas what you're saying, it's like, we want this to be fair. And the actual conversation looks like the Republicans saying, well, yeah, we also want it to be fair, but in order for that to happen, there's a lot more to it and we need to do that. And so coming to the table again, setting up with good relationships and understanding that you're coming to the table with with good intentions in good faith ready to build something then that's where that can happen but obviously like over identifying with one team or the other with whatever tribe it is allows a allows us and incentivizes us to connect that dot between oh well republicans they just they don't want anything that's fair. They're obviously just saying they want to create rules to obstruct and flip is true yeah. again. Like we're, we're limiting how we're viewing this and big picture, it's all messed up. It's all not working and we're getting hung up. Like they're benefiting the, you know, the people who are in power and don't, yeah, they, they benefit by us being divided instead of all saying, hey, wait, you're accountable to us. 
um, mm -hmm. what now? <laughs> like exactly. Yeah. 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 He talked. Talk, I was gonna say he talks about the Manichaean, so I guess this must be based on somebody named Manic or something, um, where the two parties have become purified. Mm -hmm. You know, it used to be that there were liberal Republicans and conservative Democrats. Right. But oh, wow. now the two parties have become so purified. And so it's become an either or. It's a man. It keeps on sticking in my head. Manichaean. And that's and that's that it's 100 percent on, on both sides, which means that you are either right or you're wrong. And there's no middle ground. Well, what's and to the... go against that? Go ahead. And I was going to say, and to, and to go against that is like blasphemy amongst your your side. Yeah. Well, I'm just thinking. So, like, it. What's the? I don't know the medical condition, but but where you mm -hmm. in order like is it with seizures where if they cut the connection between the left and right hemispheres that helps with that. Mm -hmm. But like that that another that is another model where it's just like all the all the connection points between left and right brain aren't aren't they're not passable anymore and yeah. It, yeah it just feels like two isolated camps that like you're saying to that point it's we've come a long way from what it used to be and because we have very few if any kind of go-betweens or people who can bridge that gap it's just two black boxes that are doing whatever they want behind closed doors um yeah. and we the citizens just have to kind of Accept it and wait. <laughs> well, One of the other take. Go ahead. I'm just saying the aggressive right and left are have taken over the conversation, and yeah. that's all we hear. And that's the pure, the purity that you're talking about, Todd. The good and the evil. And yeah. so and the aggressive people are in charge. That is wrong. Yeah, and the and the old all the, the older generations who are centrist, but in the obstructionist way are the ones who are in charge and who are benefiting from it. And yeah, if, if they let the vocal extremes rise up and kind of take the narrative in one direction or the other, and it does kind of cauterize and split, then, then again, that, that shows them a path where they actually don't ever have to worry about being accountable to anybody except for themselves and so we've seen again they talk about the revolving door within politics and all of that like it's just that's where a lot of the systemic problems if we want to use the buzzword it's it's coming from these bloated institutions that are used to not having to be accountable and that's just one of the mechanisms again we're we're hardwired to it's to make it easy to to fall into tribes and so if we're just in our own, each each hemisphere of the brain is separated from the other, and there's no, I mean, yeah, all the connection points are are very very hard to traverse. Then, yeah, those who are in charge it's and, and incentivized to maintain that power have no reason to do anything otherwise. Well, I think often that I have time to read, time to talk to you guys, time to have this podcast. What if I didn't? Would I know any of this? Would I be practicing any of this? I mean, there is, you need time to absorb and learn this piece. And most of us are going through the world. I mean, I remember this. I just, I woke up, I went to work, I came back, I ate dinner, I went to sleep. I mean, you know, rinse repeat and I did that for decades <laughs> and so you know in between I thought I was achieving goals but really I wasn't thinking about how I how I was thinking and why I was thinking what I was thinking yeah 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 I, I, you know to give a, um, a solution you know, I thought one of the things that kind of resonated and landed with me um, mm. that was towards the end of the book is, um, you know, he talks about, again, the, the elephant and the writer. 
And one of the ways to get the elephants to communicate is to spend more time together. And uh, one of the problems that's happened is that you know, our, our congressmen and our, our um, elected officials, I think since the mid-90s, maybe even earlier than that, oh, it was, it was during uh, Newt Gingrich's time, uh, he suggested that, you know, that, you know, your congressmen don't live in, in uh, Washington anymore. You know, you live at home, you go to Washington, you know, Monday through Thursday, do battle with the other side, and then come home. Mm -hmm. And it used to be more common that, you know, you're elected to Congress and you move your whole family to Washington. And the wives would get to know each other. The kids might play on the same sports teams. You'd do social things together. And that, you know, that was a much uh, easier way of helping to bridge the divide um, because you know each other socially, you know, and you're doing other things other than the battle of politics. And, you know, like I said, now it's just, you know, you, you fly to Washington for the week, you know, you put on your, your sword, you put on your, uh, your shield and take out your sword and then you come home. So that's, you know, because I think, you know, somebody was asking, you know, how do we solve this problem? And uh, I said things like that, you know, things that, that let the elephants communicate first. Yeah, it, unintended consequences, but it's crippling, mm -hmm, crippling mm -hmm. us to get anything done. I mean, 75% of us are like, would you please move forward or backwards or sideways or something, Washington? Because it's the same old, same old. And we're yeah. all frustrated. And part of it is because Congress women and men are not sharing they're not going to potlucks together and barbecues and cheering for their kids on the same team. I mean, I would have never guessed that, but it absolutely makes sense. Yeah. And I mean, it also makes sense for, you know, for to have some expectations that in order to represent a community, you probably if, if, if they were spending 100% of their time in DC outside of the community that they're serving, that also presents a lot of challenges as well. So, I mean, that, that is one argument for, for having them stay in their home, home bases in, in a lot of ways, because in order, I mean, ostensibly they're supposed to represent the communities. Um, the degree to which that is happening is, I mean, I'm sure quite diverse over, you know, it, it's a case by case basis, but there's an angle there that makes sense where it's like, well, we, it would probably, they would be more connected to their communities by being in their communities, more living in their communities, having the implications of the decisions they make in DC impact them because they also live there. So there's, there's definitely trade-offs and other things to consider yeah. in that dynamic as well, but it is, how do you how do you bring people together still when there's a job to do you're on you're in a troop you have a mission and that mission is to represent and serve and instead of bringing your highest self to that you're putting on your jerseys putting on your colors and doing whatever it takes to represent that to the you know it's yeah, I don't know. I think, I mean, they're, they're both definitely interconnected and I, I just don't know that either organ, either, uh, oh, I hear you. either configuration there like necessarily solves the problem. If, if we're just, we're just set up to do this and it's, yeah, I don't know. I, I want to give you all a chance to maybe. No, I, I would argue you. though. Go ahead. I oh, just, cause I, I hear you, Gabe. I, I see your side on that. Yeah. I argue, though, that there's two different things in the, since the 80s, which is, one, you're interconnected now. Like, if you're living in D.C. and you're representing Arizona, like, you can hear from your people all the time if you choose to. Mm -hmm. Plus, we have planes that just go back and forth every day, hundreds, thousands of times a day, 
And so you can also spend, you know, two, all those set, you know, when they're not in um, session at home, canvassing and being available. What I think Todd was talking to is there are not opportunities to have casual conversations with the other side. So now you're limited to only one way to get your, to represent your people and get the legislation through for your people. So if you're on the red team, you only have the red team to fall on. And if you're on the blue team, you only have the blue yeah. team way of doing it. And so it's, you don't have a purple way to get through anymore. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. No, to- so, I mean, that's totally heard. And yeah, yeah. I, I'm even thinking of just like it, moving it into a different world, but just like thinking like on screen versus off screen. It's like if, yeah. if the, if the relationship is only ex- like, if you don't do anything off screen mm-hmm. to develop a relationship, it's you, you, you gotta be really good and really committed in order to make that relationship come through on screen. Uh, one easier way to do that is to, yeah, develop chemistry off screen so that when you get on screen, you both can, yeah. So I, I think totally, totally hear you there. And I, I was just injecting that to, to obviously with anything, there's a nuance and to really like, that's just one other, other thing to consider because it's, it's not just really to drive home the point that it's not easy either way. So yeah, I think that's and a I great point, actually, both of you. I can add I can add another layer to that, and that is if if we didn't have career politicians, mm-hmm. and and you know you elect someone to Congress and it's four years or it's eight years, that's a much easier sell to your spouse. It's like okay, <laughs> next next four years we're going to be in Washington, and then we're coming, you know, then we're going back to real life, you know, yeah. the way our founding fathers intended. Yeah. Yeah. We, yeah. We need term limits for sure. I, I, I just don't even understand why we don't, I don't get that. Except the people well, that are making the rules don't like that idea. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's gotta be a sweet spot between, you know, the, turning over so quickly that, you know, just as, you know, as soon as you, you finally you get your footing and you know the right people and you're making all the right connections, then your term is over. You know, that, that doesn't make sense either. But yeah, you know, having somebody in office for 30 years or 40 years, is just, I don't think to that's me, the right way to go. Those people, you know, those people that are now experienced, they've had their mm-hmm. six or eight years behind them, should avail themselves to the new person that's in their spot. Like they should be their thinking partner. They should be their console. They should be their coach. They should be their guide. And your, your job doesn't finish in my opinion. And this is me when your job is done. Like I'm not a Congresswoman anymore. So, oh, well, you know, hell in a handbasket with the, with the country. Like that's not, (laughs) that's like, who wants to elect that person? So like, that's where you get the wisdom. It's, so you don't lose what you're talking about, Todd, because that's very important, all the connections and the network and the how to's, but yeah, we, sh- we need to stop electing selfish people that are there for something that's not humble. They're there for other reasons, you know, and it's really hard when the decisions are made in the primary and you've got, you know, gorilla one and gorilla two to choose from. Yeah. 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 It reminds me of something that's <laughs> Makes some, me crazy. Someone, yeah. I heard that like, you know, we, we like to say, oh, well, it's a completely democratic process, you know, and, and this is how we elected these two. And it's like, well, Ugh. yeah, it's democratic when it gets to like the last two, but the primaries is anything but democratic. You know, that's how you get someone like Tulsi Gabbard that gets booted out, you know? Yeah. <sighs> I can't tell you well, how the many... dynamic of it has always been playing up to the extremes in the primaries, right. and then you could pull back to the middle for the for the general. But yeah, the most aggressive again. Yeah, yeah. I just don't play well with that. Those folks. I usually leave the playground at that point. <laughs> yeah, 
<laughs> yeah, I don't. If you're I don't gonna know, but... start smacking kids around, I gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> That'll that'll be a good way to just wrap it all back around to just oh, no. you know getting uh, to know knowing yeah, yourself sweet. better knowing yourself better so that you you know you you want to put yourself in the best position to you know contribute the best you can and you're not going to do that if you're yeah. running at fifty percent because half of your energy is being sucked away by five minutes of news or whatever it is like if if if, if your capacity gets drained and sucked so strongly and so disproportionately by certain things like it's and you're aware of it you are well within your right to take it out of your diet so and we we noticed a lot of the the trends of the last few years with with the social dilemma stuff also just recognizing how many different factors contribute to so much skewed perceptions of of reality, whether we're talking about the complete isolation of one side versus the other, or once you introduce the, you know, the full range of, of things that we have to pull us in one way or another, and what we can choose to identify with or not, it's, I mean, it's hard to even, you, you know, all I can, all I can take comfort, comfort in is knowing that I have at least maybe some amount of control over where my my next footstep lands and beyond that not a whole lot else so (laughs) yeah i mean we all have taken such a a burden on our shoulders on our podcast specifically because we're trying to do something that is hard unpopular uncool which is like can we have a constructive nuanced conversation about something that's normally fraught with disgust, anger, and aggression. And it kind of seems like, let's just have adult conversations, which I always thought adults could do. Now that I am one, not so much. (laughs) (laughs) Right? Yeah. And and I I think that's why I like our, our weekly meeting so much is because you know, you can come into the chat room or the room and say something that's very passionate and you won't get any, anything, but, oh, wow. I hadn't thought of that that way. That's like the worst you're going to get because we're all doing. Toby Todd work. and I can get a couple jabs in here and there, but it's, <laughs> it's all in good fun as far as, as far as I know, but we, you know, we go, we go way back, but we're, all the way back. So yeah, yeah. I mean, you're, we're we're both IU grads, so we have that. <laughs> yeah, well. no, I totally echo that, Kimberly. And it's it's just again, I hate. I mean, yeah, I'm not even gonna say the term. Oh, I, now I have to say it. I'm not gonna right. say safe space because it's not a safe space. But that's the point. It's that we all know that we. It's an accepting space. It's a welcome space. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's one one concept I've been hearing is just there's no safe spaces. Like we need to get rid of that idea that, especially on on the internet, we we no place is safe, no place is private on the internet. So any any idea or any any belief that an online space is a safe space is kind of ignoring some huge you know uh, surveillance information that we all seem to De- understand De- and accept but so no place is safe but define can be safe. welcoming and you have to kind accepting. of define safe yeah 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 so i think our role is you know the water's fine <laughs> come on in <laughs> because the more the merrier for us and the more nuanced and the more diverse and the more um interesting conversations that we have here and offline is that's where I think the meat of the country is. I think that's yeah. where the country's going to, that's the direction that we're going to go to eventually because we have screwed up pretty royally. And I think there's enough of us now that are like disgusted with the lack of polite conversation. Yeah. 
Well, you said earlier, I, Kimberly, that you, you've yeah. stopped bathing in partisan waters and, and going to that purification <laughs> idea where both sides have been purified. Like, uh oh, you know, wh- that's where it is. The water we're always in is very murky, very complicated. And that's what we prefer. We prefer to swim and bathe in murky waters and, and instead of the all yeah. purified holy water that's free from all impurities. It's, yeah, we prefer it a little, a little If I could d- do it, dirty. anyone can do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the water's dirty. The water's dirty whether you believe it is or not. So mm. lying to yourself or being in denial and, and the, the, the contortions you have to make to believe that you're swimming in clean, purified waters are quite extreme yeah it's never that clean it's never that pure like again the microbiologist pointing out there's there's (laughs) always something to contaminate even on those little flies i was just thinking about the fly swatter (laughs) well i see where i can't remember when exactly we started this recording but we are hidden uh uh, we're we're going deep, which is you know characteristic of me. But now <laughs> seems maybe like a good time to ask for just final thoughts. Again, like obviously we 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 as a podcast, uh, speaking for the whole podcast, would definitely recommend this book highly. Um, and knowing that it's it's something that you can kind of piece by piece go through and learn the lessons and and even just you know. Have it, have it handy, pick it up, read a chapter, or there's, there's good summaries at the end of each chapter, I'm told. Um, so it's, it's just a handy kind of thing to have around. And, and just, I think for all of us, really, if, if nothing else, articulated some of the ways that we can choose to look at things and understand how we, how we tend to operate in, in, in the grouping behaviors and, and all of that. So um again highly recommending the book as anyone it's 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 should be well known by now jonathan height is he's made the rounds he's a familiar name um especially within the unity movement i'm sure everyone will know him but hopefully beyond um but yeah i guess what would be y'all's pitch or just final final thoughts takeaways um interesting tidbits that stood out to you but i don't know who wants to go first? I'll go. Um, yeah, for those of you that don't know who Jonathan Haidt is, if any of you did see The Social Dilemma, they actually did interview him on that. Um, he talked about the, um, the tweens, the tween girls, that you know the, the suicide rate has like, skyrocketed since social media has taken over and stuff. And so um, if you... Which plays into what Kimberly that, was talking about. The reputational aggression, yes, which is what yeah yes. Peterson was hitting on. So that being the manifestation, exactly. yeah. Sorry, exactly. I didn't interrupt. So but. so he, so he's so he's not a unknown quantity. You you may have seen him, and yeah, he may even look familiar to you. But uh, it's it's a really good book, and it's easy read and or listen. So um, yeah. Well, I've listened to Jonathan Hyde a few times now on Clubhouse, which has been pretty cool. And I would like to read uh, The Coddling of the American Mind, which I I wanted to read this first because I wanted to get the foundation. But I have to tell you, when I picked it up, because I was so eager to answer my own problem, I went right to the second to last chapter. I didn't even read the first part of it at all. And it's titled, Can't We All Disagree More Constructively? So, like, I went right to that chapter and then in a subsequent meeting todd's like oh did you see the moral foundations of politics and i'm like no which you need to read that in order to understand the last chapter i'm just saying but every every chapter is uh summed up but i think you missed the the stories because we remember things through stories and he's got great stories in there and so he takes examples from myth, mythology, his personal stories, and then stories of other uh, well-known authors. So, 
Yes, I highly recommend. Yeah. It's a great foundation. You will learn something about yourself in here. And probably the one person that you're having a hard time having a conversation with about politics or religion. <laughs> yeah. And again, yes. it's a common so buy, buy two copies <laughs> oh. <laughs> and give one to your enemy. I don't enemy. think everyone's ready for that. Like, here's your <laughs> copy. Here's mine. You'd have to be married that person. What were you saying, Todd? <laughs> oh, well, I was just going to say, and it's, and it's a... It's a the right word uh calming or soothing mm. thing because you kind of read it and you're like oh i don't have to hate this other person because this is where they're yeah. coming from and they're you know just as uh as um uh, uh, able to have a you know that that opinion and and uh, justified and and, and uh, um you know, justified to have that opinion and doesn't make them bad and it doesn't make me good, you know? And it's, it's just, it's much easier to like see other people that way and, and not feel as angry, you know? Yeah. The only thing I'm, I'm disappointed in is that more people don't read this and are at the same place that, of course, that sounds really righteous, but the same place that I'm at from reading it. But yeah, you know, I mean, it's a like constant, it's a constant journey. It's, I mean, a lot of it kind of reminded, uh, reminded me of, of meditation practice and all of that. It's like, it's, mm. you can really, again, become attached and identified with where you are in that and, and lose sight of the fact that you still need it just as much as you ever did. Um, but I, I know for myself, so, so much of it is once you start doing something, um, and, and really like put into practice a new process. It's, it's once you put on a new set of lenses, it's kind of impossible not to, not to see other out, outgrowths of that in your life and just recognize different patterns that people exhibit. Or, you know, I, I, at one point I was working at a coffee shop. So dealing with a lot of customers that I knew from the community and it's just like certain ones I could tell it was like I had been working on this pattern in myself that wasn't healthy for me and then it's like by working on that and looking deeper I I saw a lot more signs I discovered a lot more signs by looking at my own story that other people's behaviors now I had a different way of viewing it and it's like oh they're they're probably doing this because you know they they have something else they have something else going on. And if I have gaps or I have these like deficiencies still, there's always areas that I don't know. Well, more likely than not, that can be applied to anybody I encounter ever. So to, to expect, it's almost like we're holding people to, to be their highest version of themselves at every instant without applying that to ourselves or even if we do apply it to ourselves right. we still again have to offer that grace and extend that room to you know you are where you are where <laughs> at, at whatever point in time it is and yeah. all you can do is what you can do <laughs> yeah do your keep part. trucking man keep trucking <laughs> read this book listen to it i don't know put it on the radio Audio book. Yeah. Oh, I would love actually... for our listeners to tell us what other books they would like to hear. Like, what oh. books are they reading and what should we be reading? And maybe we can get the author or the editors or somebody else on to talk about a book that's really sparking the movement. So I'd love to hear that. Strategic thinking from our, our captain. That's, yeah, a great <laughs> idea. So definitely... Uh, like subscribe leave, leave it in the comments do all of those things uh in the reviews whatever How, however you can you know get in contact with us um let us know your thoughts we're happy to yeah this was a lot of fun so i i don't see any reason why we can't keep up some little uh book club side gig for the for the show um I guess, yeah, we'll, we'll just go ahead and wrap. Thanks both of you so much for, for being here, Kimberly and, and Todd, just based on your name for a minute there. Nothing personal. Thank you. Um, but uh, okay. yeah. It's okay, Greg. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Again, yeah, um, we're, we're Unity now. This is a glimpse into part of our team. And like I said before, part of our all the way back team. 
So we've been doing this for almost a year now, coming up on 10, 11 months, yes. which is kind of wild. Um, but yeah, thanks for being part of it to the extent you've been a part of it. And hopefully you will opt in to continue to be a part of it moving forward. So in order to do that, subscribe on YouTube or anywhere you listen to podcasts. And we will be back with you shortly. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching the Unity Now podcast. If you enjoyed our show, follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram by clicking the links in the description below. Bye.